trust in the Savior who raises the dead. We trust in the Savior who raises the dead. Well, good morning and welcome to this seminar with um, Professor John Wyatt. As we look this week about uh, the challenges of uh, retirement, the transitions of later life, uh, and more than that. Um, it's a tremendous privilege to welcome back to the convention, John. John, perhaps if you could come up here. Uh, John is Emeritus Professor of Neonatal Medicine at UCL in London. He's well known to us as a friend of the convention. He's spoken here many times before. Uh, he's uh, uh, married to Celia, we're going to be hearing from them both together at the Keswick Lecture on Wednesday. Uh, and they have, I think, it's four grandchildren. Four grandchildren. Um, he's also well known to us as the author of a number of books which many of us have profited from, Matters of Life and Death, a book about sort of, uh, a Christian uh, approach to medical ethics, um, Dying Well, which some of you would have seen, uh, and The Last Lap about retirement. And I'm told a forthcoming book on friendship, which we look forward to. Can I open it with prayer, and then I'll hand straight over to John. Our loving Father, thank you for the opportunity to think today about retirement. And we pray that you'll help each one of us as a result of today to have a much clearer idea of how to use this particular gift in that stage of life with the challenges that go with it. So help John, we pray, to teach us uh, with great clarity, and we, we ask that the outcome would be godly living that honors you. Amen. Amen. John will speak, and then there'll be a Q&A at the end. John, thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks very much, Alistair. And it's a real privilege for me to be able to take a, a series of four seminars on facing uh, retirement, then on dependence, uh, on the issue of dementia, and then finally the, approaching the finishing line and dying. And um, obviously, these are really challenging, difficult topics. And I don't want in any way to sanitize, to try and pretend that there aren't really difficult and painful issues for all of us to face. But I hope as we journey together on running the final lap, that we can also see some of the amazing possibilities and privileges that we have as uh, people who, are, who have been on the journey for some time. I've just hit 70, and uh, so I've had my three score years and 10, and I'm already feeling like I'm living on borrowed time. And uh, as for all of us, we have no idea what the future holds for us. It may be that we'll be called to glory very rapidly. That's happened to uh, some of my friends who seemed healthy and then suddenly they're gone. Uh, it may be that many of us, including myself, have, have many years of fruitful service ahead of us. So how do we cope as we're in this final lap? And one of the verses that I'm going to use as a kind of foundational verse 
is uh, this verse in Hebrews. Now, I just want to say that we're going to have a, a, a short period for Q&A uh, after each of the sessions, uh, and because of this large space, the logistics are sometimes not so easy in terms of asking questions. So if there are particular issues or questions on your mind, can you write them down on a piece of paper, and, and they'll be collected at the end, and that will give me the opportunity in future seminars to try and address uh, questions or issues that, that, have, that have come up. So, this wonderful uh, passage from Hebrews, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So the image is of an endurance race, a marathon. And, and we're very familiar with images like this, with the crowds watching, with the runners, with their eyes fixed on the future. And so I want to draw out a number of um, uh, particular points from this vision that the writers of the Hebrews give us. And, and the first is that each one of us is running a race which has been individually marked out for us. So, in the scriptures teach us that God saw you and knew you and loved you from before the foundation of the world and that he called you into existence. If you're a believer, he wrote your name in the Lamb's Book of Life and he called you into existence at a particular point of world history, and he gave you a particular race to run, or to change the metaphor, he, he made a part to play the, for, for you to play as a bit player in the great drama, the great drama of the ages. And so each one of us has a part to play. Each one of us has a race, an individual race, which has been marked out for us. And uh, that, that phrase, marked out, you know, so the, the path has got, when, when people are running a marathon, of course, it, 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 the path is marked out so that you know exactly where you're going. And in the same way, our path has been marked out for us. And we, secondly, we need perseverance it's very clear that this is not a sprint. This is an endurance race, it's a marathon. And I have never run a marathon. The best I've ever managed is uh, 10K, uh, about seven miles. But uh, I know uh, that in any endurance race, there are ups and downs, there are good phases. You know, when you're running downhill and it seems like you could go on forever. And then there are really tough places in the race <clears throat> where you just feel <clears throat> that you're going to, um, you, that you just can't go on. Experienced <clears throat> marathon runners talk about hitting the wall, which often happens towards the end of the race, when it just seems that all their muscles are exhausted and they can't carry on. So. We shouldn't be surprised that in this marathon race that we're all running, there are some bits which seem easy, and there are other bits which are a real slog. There's struggle, there's suffering, and sometimes, isn't it true, we're all persuaded to give up, particularly in those later stages, in that final lap. That's one of the temptations of the final lap the temptation to give up, to say, it's just too much. But thirdly, we're not alone. This, there's a great cloud of witnesses cheering us on, you know, that image of the runners coming into the stadium. And there they all are. Uh, although actually, they're not just spectators. All the people in the stadium who are watching us are previous runners. And they finished the race, 
And now they're cheering us on, they're encouraging us. And it's not just the heavenly witnesses who are there watching our race, but this is a group race. We're in this together. And uh, you've probably seen those pictures of, uh, of sometimes in a race when uh, one person is stumbling and almost falling and the other people in the race stop and they pull them along uh, and they encourage them along and support them, even sometimes supporting them all the way uh, to the finishing line. So then there's, that's the beautiful image, isn't it? We're in this race together. We're supporting one another. It's a race which involves all the Christian family. But very importantly, this is not just a slog. It's not just about gritted teeth hanging on there until we get to that finishing line. No, what the writer to the Hebrews tells us is that it's all about joy. So it says, for the joy that was set before him, Jesus endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And so it does seem to me that ultimately the race is all about joy. There is the joy that is to come after the finishing line, but there is also the inexpressible joy to discover within the race itself. That's what the, uh, Peter says. Uh, we believe in him, and although that we do not see him, we rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. So there is joy in accomplishing and fulfilling each stage of the race with God's help. And I noticed there's something in the, he, in the Greek of that passage which doesn't come out in our modern translations. So as I, as I read it in the English translation in the ESV, it says, let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. But actually the same word uh, uh, in Greek is the word for the race that is marked out for us and the joy that is marked out for Jesus. It's exactly the same word. And I think that means, and the implication therefore, is that God has marked out joy for you in the race, just as he's marked out joy for Jesus. And so we, yes, there is struggle, yes, there is difficulty, but fundamentally, joy has been marked out for you, joy has been marked out for me. So that's the metaphor of the endurance race, but now we're going to particularly look at retirement and the transition into retirement. And here, we are pretty well unique. This generation is pretty well unique in the history of the world. Something strange and wonderful is happening, and it's, the evidence of it is in this tent this morning, and that is the increasing number of older people, most of whom are amazingly healthy. So if you just look at life expectancy, uh, the average person that's in, who, who reaches 65 can expect to live uh, 20 years if they're males, 22 years if they're females. That's the average. And of course, around the average, there are huge variations. Um, but as you project that forward uh, to 2045, the, the life expectancy continues to increase. And uh, astonishingly, the Office of National Statistics say of babies born this year in the UK, one in five girls, uh, one in six boys are expected to live beyond 100 years. Now, of course, predicting the future is always uh, fraught with difficulty. There are contrary voices saying, actually, because of the rise of obesity and uh, diabetes and reduced exercise and so on. Actually, the generations who come after us may turn out to be less healthy than we are. 
In fact, our generation might well turn out to be the healthiest generation and therefore the generation with the longest life expectancy. Who knows? But it does mean that for us, we have been given this extraordinary phenomenon of life uh, and health uh, in our later years. And this has never happened before. There have always been a few old people. There's always been the odd one who made it uh, beyond 80, but they were always extreme rarities. What is so different now is that God is giving us this gift of life to so many of us in our later years. And I think it's easy to think, well, really, is that a good thing? Do I actually want to go on? Wouldn't it be better to just go to glory? But I love these words of Ian Knox, a long life is a gift, not a curse. It's full of possibilities, and the gift is the gift of time. So, dealing with retirement it is a challenge. It's something, it's one of those issues which I retired from the NHS some years ago. Uh, I was looking for it, forward to it. I was absolutely exhausted. And um, the pressure, uh, both of uh, the clinical pressure, but also the academic pressure of leading a large research team of all the hassle and so on. I, I, and so I retired, um, but I was, I was taken aback by the sense of disorientation and confusion and challenge it, it led to me. And it made me realize how much of my identity, of who I thought I was, was actually rooted in my work, in my employment. And um, when I was working as, as, a, as a clinician in the NHS, I used to walk onto the baby intensive care unit where I was a consultant, and immediately people would say, now, why are you so late? We need to start the ward round, and we haven't, you need to talk to those parents, and we need to make a decision about this, and can you sort this out, this problem? And I'm just saying, get off my back, you know. And yet, all those demands are giving a message that I, was, I had a role to play in this team. I was an important member of the team. And just a few months later, I went back to visit the baby unit, uh, just to see how things were going. And I arrive at the door, and I, I, I'm buzzed in, and I walk down the corridor, and a nurse comes up to me, clip-clop, 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 hello, can I help you? <laughs> and I suddenly think, yep, that's it. You know, I would have no role here. Uh, they've already forgotten who I am. And um, so rapidly you become yesterday's news. Nobody's interested in what you think anymore because you're yesterday, you're yesterday's person. And so I went through a, a period of real questioning and doubt and uncertainty. And, uh, and it took me, I think, probably two years or more uh, before I started to recognize and, and feel more settled in this new phase of life that God was giving me. And s subsequently, I became aware that, that actually there are some really helpful resources which can help people in the process of retiring. And, uh, and one of them is this, which has been produced a course called Retiring Well. It's been produced by my friend, Helen Calder, who was a senior administrator in both uh, Christian and secular organizations with a, a wealth of business experience. And um, she uh, created this course, uh, Retiring Well, and I strongly recommend it. There's, there are several volumes she's now got, uh, Preparing for Retirement, and then actually in the early years of retirement. Uh, they can be done as small groups, or you can do it, work through it individually. Helen's going to be here on Thursday, and uh, she will have flyers and information about the course if you're interested, uh, but you can also find it uh, online. 
And uh, I rather wish that I'd known about that course because I think it's an excellent way of just exploring all the issues. Um, and, and one of the fundamental things, of course, is that there are gains, but there are losses. There are genuine losses in retirement. And instead of pretending that those losses don't happen, it's much better to, to analyze and accept that these, this is the transition. There are losses, but we then there are new opportunities, there are new gains, there are new possibilities. And one of the things I learned in, in my own transition, and as I was exploring this and talking to various people and so on, I found this concept quite helpful, and that is the problem, as we all know, is that as we get older, our general energy levels start to decline. You know, uh, on a good day, when everything, when the wind's behind me, I can be really functioning quite well. But on other days, it just seems there's the fatigue and the, the, I've just run out of energy. And of course, that's what happens in a long distance race. That, that's the challenge in a long distance race. So uh, distance runners say you have to conserve your energy. You don't want to blow it all in the first half. You need to conserve your energy for that final lap. So, as we know, all of us have uh, duties and responsibilities. We have duties and cares and responsibilities to our loved ones, uh, to sometimes children, to our spiritual children, uh, to the roles that we're, we're taking on. But, so, life is always has musts and shoulds and oughts. But the trouble is that those musts and shoulds and oughts, they, they're draining, they're tiring, they, they sap our energy. And so, as we come to this phase of our life, I think as our energy levels drop, we need to look especially to those things, those activities, those concerns, those forms of service that thrill our hearts. Instead of them, I really must, I really should, I really ought, what do we look for? We should try to look for the thing that says, I would just love to. Wouldn't it be amazing if? Wouldn't that be a wonderful possibility? And that is, I think, one of the questions we need to ask I'm not necessarily talking about the bucket list, you know. Wouldn't it be amazing to go on a world cruise, <laughs> even if you could afford it? But the question is, what forms of, of service, of, of being the person that God made you to be, in what way might you be able uh, to fulfill that? Because those are the places, the concerns, which energize and motivate us. And for me, as I reflected and thought about what were the things that really sets my heart alight, you know, that's a very useful question to ask for reflection. Think back on your life to date and try and think about those moments where you said, wow, where your heart just swelled and where you said, yes, this is what I'm made for. Yes, this is why I'm here. Because those moments don't happen very often, but I think when they do happen, they're a kind of epiphany, they're a kind of revelation of the way that God has made you, you as a unique person. What is it that sets your heart alight? And as we get older, I think are the challenges to try and find ways so we spend the, the maximum amount of time in things which really set us alight, in things which energize us and motivate us, and the minimum amount of time in the musts and the shoulds and the oughts that, that sap our energy. And that's a challenge, and, it, and it, it's not an easy thing to do, but we need to sort of reflect, as I reflected on my own uh, thinking, there were, there were two things which particularly set my heart alight. And one was, 
intergenerational friendship, um, investing in the next generation, finding younger Christian brothers and sisters in whom I could have a kind of Paul-Timothy relationship. That was one of the things I just think, what a wonderful privilege just to be able to spend time with a younger person who's hungry and who wants to learn more about how to serve God. And so that's something that really energizes and motivates me. That's, incidentally, that's why I've written a book called Transforming Friendship, which will be coming out later this year in November, published by IVP. Um, and the second thing is, is sharing with other people what God has given me, uh, which is what I love doing. And uh, it's, a, it's a great privilege for me to have those opportunities to share. And again, this sets my heart a light. This is, this is why God made me. Now, but for all, each of us, it's all different. Every one of us is made uniquely. Every one of us, as we said, has a unique race which has been made for you to run. But the question is, what are the things which set us alight? What are the things that give us joy? Because remember, it's all about joy. God's plan for us is not that we have this final lap, gritted teeth, but with joy as we serve him, as we find more of what it means to become the people that God created us to be. There's a lovely uh, quote from the American uh, Christian writer, Frederick Buchner, and he says this, the place God calls you to is the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. In other words, I, as a scientist, I can't help thinking of it as a graph. Along one axis, you've got the way my heart is made, and, and, and where my, this is my heart's gladness. And along the horizontal axis is the world's deepest needs. And somewhere, there's a point where they meet. And that point says Buchner, is the place that God is calling you to. It's the place where the heart's deep gladness meets the world's deep hunger. And it's that deep gladness that we experience when we find God's unique calling, which energizes and renews us. There's a beautiful example of this in Psalm 103, <clears throat> where the psalmist praises God who satisfies you with good things so that our youth is renewed like the eagles. So it's about satisfaction. God, as he satisfies us, literally the Hebrew says, he satisfies us with the good. God satisfies us with the good. Why? So that our youth is renewed like the eagles. And of course, the eagle that wonderful image of the eagle with its wings outstretched, which then catches the thermal and then circles higher and higher, uh, whether by the spirit being lifted up. Uh, it's not flapping desperately. It's supported and lifted by the spirit. But notice that as we are satisfied with good things, that our youth is renewed. Now, of course, as we go along our, li our life's journey, as we go along this race, aspects of our calling frequently change as we go through the different laps. And certainly I can see for myself that uh, my calling when I was a hands-on baby doctor, a lot of it was about trying to be the presence of Christ with those who are suffering, trying to be the hands of Christ in that particular context. Now I'm in a different phase of my life, and my calling, some of the things are changing. God is opening up new possibilities for me, closing down things which were really important to me in the past. And, and so we need to reflect about this point. It's not just, yes, it's important to think back on the past, but just because that was my calling in the past doesn't mean that's not what I'm being called to now. What, it, what is it, what are my particular gifts, what are my callings at this stage of the race. And I can't help thinking, therefore, that raises to me a really important question, and that is, 
what are old people for? What are we all for, all of you who are 70 and above? What are we here for? And in particular, what are old people for in the Christian church, in the Christian community? Because this seems to me like a pretty important question. God is giving an enormous number of old people to the church, to the world, and so we need to think about this question, well, what are we all for? What, what is our particular role in the community? And I just want to give you a list of some suggestions of what I think old people are for, in no particular order, but here are some things that I think old people are for. Number one, prayerfulness, especially for the younger generation. My wife's mother, both, uh, both our parents, my, my, particularly my father and my wife Celia's mother, have been amazing examples of praying grandparents. And in particular, Celia's mother, uh, she, as she had, uh, I think it's 13 grandchildren, uh, 11 of whom were going on with the Lord and two weren't, and Granny was on the case. And uh, she realized that she needed to teach herself email, because that's what all these young people did. This is quite a long time ago. <laughs> Probably she'd be teaching herself TikTok, I think, now. But <laughs> and, uh, so, and she insisted that each one of her grandchildren sent her an email every week telling her what she was doing, what they were doing on each day of the week so she could pray for them specifically. And she told them, I'm going to pray for you every day and I need you to tell me what you're doing. And, um, and they all took it very seriously. Nearly all of them used to send her an email, you know, I've got this exam, I, really, I need, need to get Granny to pray, to pray for that. And, um, and, and she used to she used to catch up and, and, and check up with them. And you said, on Thursday, you were meeting up with these friends. Well, what happened? I was praying for you. And, and so you could see uh, our children, the, the grandchildren, taking this very seriously because Granny was praying and they needed to make sure she was praying. But also, wonderfully, it, um, it provided a kind of accountability because I could see our boys saying, well, if I was to go off the rails... I suppose mummy and daddy would be quite upset, but what am I going to say to granny? <laughs> so so uh, it was a wonderful model of a praying grandparents. And it, I've, we've come to realize that's one of the principal roles that grandparents should play. Christian grandparents are those who pray for their grandchildren, but you let them know. Let them know you're praying and ask specifically uh, for how you can pray, how you can support them, how you can uh, be, be, uh, be encouraging them. Secondly, just a listening ear. You know, when I was working in the NHS and trying to fix up time, you know, somebody said, can I come and talk to you? It was sometimes embarrassing, you know, getting out the diary. And I, well, I, th I think in about sort of, you know, six weeks time on a Thursday evening, I might just be able to slot you in. You know, but actually now that I haven't got that full-time employment, it's so much easier to say, well, you know what? There's nothing much happening on Thursday. Why don't we, why don't we meet then? Just that availability for others is an enormous gift in this world in which so many working people are so busy, so consumed and preoccupied. To have people in the community who are available and who say, yeah, that's fine. Why don't you come around? Uh, I, I'm making myself available, and I'm just a listening ear. And then related to that is this investing in deep intergenerational friendships. I have benefited so much as a younger man from older people who invested in me, older people who cared about me, and who, and who showed an interest, and who told me they were going to pray for me, and how could they pray for me. I can remember Auntie Jane when I was just 14 or 15. Uh, she was this godly single lady. And she told me that she cared for me and she was praying for me. Uh, she was a single lady in her 60s. There was Auntie Edie. She was in her 70s. She was also 
praying for me and caring for me. And then as a student, there were a whole number of people, uh, Christian leaders and others who told me, I want to pray for you, I want to care for you, I want to support you, how can, how can I help you? And that meant such a lot to me. And now I realize so much of my life at a human level is because of these older people who invested in me, who cared about me as a younger man. And so now, by God's grace, I'm trying to do the same thing. And you know, although this phrase investing in friendship, it sounds rather transactional and rather financial, actually I think it's, it's, it's quite a good phrase, and that is because what financial advisors will tell you is that the value of investments can't be predicted, it may, may go up, they may go down. You don't know, and that's the point. When you're investing, when you're spending time with a younger person, when you're making yourself available, when you're supporting them and praying for them and encouraging them, you don't know what the consequences will be. It's, it's an exercise of faith, hope, and love. But by God's grace, your input might turn out to be something really significant. Offering life wisdom in a non judgmental way. Now that's one of the besetting sins, isn't it, of uh, older people is a sort of negative judgmentalism. Everything's rubbish. Of course, it was much better in my day. Of course, you know, if only they used to do things that either way I think, everything would be fine. You know, that kind of really negative stuff, I'm afraid, isn't helpful. But offering life wisdom uh, is something which younger people desperately need. You know, one of the things I've been learning about is about the aging brain. I'm interested in neuroscience as a, as, a, as a scientist, and so I've been reading some books and research about the aging brain. And interestingly, it's not all bad news. So we all know that there are some bad things about the aging brain, and particularly memory loss and losing names and uh, all that kind of stuff. Um, and and there's, there are strong biological reasons why that's happening to particular areas of our brain. But there are other functions that the aging brain is actually gets better at as time goes on and continues to improve. And in particular, it seems that the aging brain gets better and better at pattern recognition, at recognizing patterns from the past. Uh, and not, not just physical patterns, but patterns in terms of relationships, patterns in terms of uh, communities, in terms of experiences, and so on. And I don't know about you, but if you think about it, it's quite common, you know, in an organization or sometimes in a church or something like that, and something is happening that maybe there's some kind of problem or some kind of issue has, has blown up, and the younger people seem to be completely at sea, and they're saying, I can't understand it. I don't know what's going on here. It seems completely mysterious. And you, looking on as an older person, think, actually, it's pretty obvious what's going on here, isn't it? And that's because you recognize the pattern, and you're there instantly. You don't need to go with a huge amount of research. It's just pretty obvious what the pattern is. And that's part of what, that's what life wisdom is. It's learning the patterns, learning the ways that God works, learning the ways that the human heart works, learning all the foibles, and then using that life wisdom, offering that life wisdom. That's one of the roles that we have as older people in the church community. Another one thing is sharing our faith and hope in Christ uh, with others. You know, one of the interesting things that came out of the pandemic was that some churches found that although it seemed that many young people were quite resistant and closed to any uh, reaching out from Christian churches, there seemed to be many older people in their communities who were much more open and much more interested to discuss spiritual things. And it certainly is not true for all people, but it does seem to me there are some people who come to retirement and beyond when this opens up a new kind of spiritual hunger, a new kind of spiritual searching. 
You know, there are many people of the baby boomer generation who've done extremely well uh, with their careers, and they've done well, and they've bought houses, and they're financially secure, and then they come to retirement, and they're saying, is this it? Is this really what life is all about? And so that, not for all, but for some, there may be a new openness. But the other thing I've noticed is that when you get older, it's actually easier in some ways to push the boat out and just strike up conversations uh, with people and, and start talking about spiritual things. You know, when I was uh, employed by the NHS, I had to be much more careful about what I said about Christian things, particularly in a professional context. You know, I was sometimes walking a tightrope with what I could get away with and what could get me into trouble and all the rest. Now I'm retired, nobody cares. You know, if that old fogey wants to go off on his weird religious mumbo jumbo, that's fine, you know, let him. You know, so actually, again, there's a kind of new uh, freedom, a kind of new openness uh, that we can have uh, about sharing our faith. I think another one, just gratitude and thankfulness. You know, what should old people, what are old people for? They're for being thankful. Isn't that something, it's, a, it's an interesting thing as you get older. I don't know if it's happening to you, it's certainly happening to me. I'm finding I'm more thankful for the little things, the smaller things, the, the things which is so easy to ignore, uh, about the sunlight, about a little bird, about the beauty of the creation, about the beauty of a smile in a baby's face. The kind of little things. You know, when you're busy in your, crea- in your job and you've got all these uh, ambitions and goals and, 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 and things you need to do, it's so easy just to rush past those little things. And now we're older, we can learn more about gratitude and thankfulness, and reminding younger people to be grateful. Uh, Wouldn't it be wonderful if we were known as people who were just filled with gratitude, filled with thankfulness uh, for the good things? Remember that phrase again, who satisfies us. God satisfies us with the good, so that our youth is renewed. And then we need to be providing positive models of letting go. You know, something I've noticed about the previous generation, the the generation that went through the war, is that they had a sort of incredible resilience and independence. In order to survive the war, they were incredibly independent, self-reliant, and so on. But they tended to find it really difficult to let go. They found it really difficult to hand over. And so many of that older generation went into their old age and went into dependence with that their hands tightly clasped until eventually they had to, their hands had to be prized off with them kicking and screaming, I want to do it my way, I want to stay in my house, I want to be in control of my life. And actually, I think we can learn from that. I'm trying to learn from that and saying that is not the right way to do it. What we've got to learn to do is let go graciously and that rather than hanging on, seeing the points at which it's now time to hand over responsibilities, it's now time to accept that things are moving on. Hopefulness. You know, one, an, another besetting sin of old age is a kind of cynicism, a kind of despair. It's all hopeless. And, and you know, That's not a Christian way. A Christian way is hopefulness, constantly pointing to the resurrection, to the power of God's forgiveness and redemption and the new creation. And um, I think with G.K. Chesterton who said, there are two sins against Christian hope. There is the sin of presumption, presuming everything's gonna be fine, and there's the sin of despair, Nothing can, make th- nothing can make it better. Nothing can improve things. And interestingly, he says they're both sins. They're sins against Christian hope. Instead, we need the discipline of Christian hope. Every day, choosing 
what I am going to focus on. Even, yes, there are challenges, yes, there are problems, yes, there are difficulties, yes, I have fears about so many things that I could allow myself to be swallowed up by, but I'm going to practice the discipline of Christian hope. And then leaving behind a legacy. And I'm not talking primarily about what you're going to do with your house or with your savings. I'm talking about something that's probably even more important, and that is a spiritual legacy. What is your spiritual legacy? What are you going to pass on to the next generation? And um, what are you going to, the legacy of wisdom, a legacy of a testimony, a witness to God's character and faithfulness over my life? It's not just God's character in general. How has God's faithfulness actually been revealed in your life? What have you learned about God's faithfulness? And if you have learned something about God's faithfulness, about his love, about his character, then you have a responsibility to pass that on. So it, it's your legacy. Um, my dad, who was not a great writer, but he, um, he spent months of his last years writing an autobiography, going through in detail, and he was writing it for his grandchildren and explaining you know, how he'd come to faith as a young man and, and how he'd met my mother and their experiences and how God had saved his life during the war and, and led him and so on. And at the time when he was doing this, I, I was thinking, this is a bit weird, isn't it? I mean, but now I understand it. Now I understand why it was important to him. He was wanting to leave a spiritual legacy. He was wanting to put down how God had led him. So, you know, one of the wonderful things we can do is write letters, write something down for the next generation. Or if, we, or if you're not a writer, then record it. Record uh, your experiences of how God has, has led you. You know, because that's what young people need. They need to hear the reality. Not, not, not a romantic, nostalgic, uh, but the truth. They want to hear the truth about what it was like and how God led and what you learned about God's character and about his faithfulness. And that's part of what we, we're here to do. So just recapping uh, those, I'm gonna go back then over, the, over those slides. Let's just look at them again. Prayerfulness, a listening ear, investing in deep friendships, offering life wisdom, sharing faith and hope in Christ, expressing gratitude, providing positive models of letting go, hopefulness pointing towards the resurrection and the new creation, leaving a legacy. And so, I come back to this quote, a long life is a gift, not a curse. It's full of possibilities, and the gift is the gift of time. How are we going to use this amazing gift of time that God has given us in the final lap? And, um, you know, in secular thinking, there's a huge amount of despair and hopelessness about old age. The, the, the people are trying to combat that. The, the, the current thinking is that, is that life, you know, the, the most popular academic approach is life has four ages. There's the first age of childhood, there's the second age of productivity, there's the third age, which is what happens at retirement, and the third age is supposedly a time of great activity and possibility. I mean, the kind of images, if you look on the internet, the kind of images you get of the third age are fit, tanned, a bronzed elderly people running marathons or sitting on a beach and uh, sipping a fine wine, staring at the sunset, you know, or they're on a cruise around the world. This is the third age. 
And, and governments are desperate to try and keep people in this third age as long as possible because that saves money, because they're productive. And then the fourth age is when you get to become dependent. And in secular thinking, the third age is quite good as long as you can go around the world and really enjoy yourself and burn through your children's inheritance, um, as quite a lot of older people seem to be doing. Uh, and the fourth age is in completely negative. It is a complete waste of time. It's a terrible, it's financially burdensome, it's painful, and it's useless. And of course, that's part of the argument for mercy killing or for assisted suicide. What possible reason? Well, as we're going to see tomorrow, uh, that's not the Christian perspective. But so in the secular world, you know, life goes to a, starts from nothing. It gets better and better and better. It comes to a peak. Everything's getting stronger. Your brain's getting better. Your muscles are getting stronger. Everything's getting better. And then you hit 25. <laughs> and from 25 onwards, you're on the long, slow decline downwards. And, uh, and to begin with, and the cells are starting to wreck and your DNA is uh, damage is accumulating, and to begin with, the damage is all interior, and you can't really see it, but then gradually, the cellular damage accumulates and gets worse, and then your hair starts to go gray, and your skin goes wrinkly, and your muscles go flabby, and the damage gets worse and worse and worse and worse, and then you die, and that's it. But in secular, th in Christian thinking, it's completely different, and this is one of my favorite verses. The path of the righteous is like the first gleam of dawn shining ever brighter until the full light of day. And so the image is like this. Have you ever been driving through the night or traveling through the night and it's black and it's dark and it seems to go on forever? And then out there on the horizon, you see the first blush of dawn and you know inexorably, moment by moment, the day is coming. Nothing will stop it. And that's the image. We are, yes, there is darkness, but our eyes are fixed on the first gleam of dawn, growing, growing, growing into the everlasting day. May God help us to live like that. Okay, I'm going to stop there. We've got just under 10 minutes for some responses, Q&A. Uh, Alistair, would you like to uh, help us? We've got some mics. Yes, thank you. Excuse me, put your hand up and wait for the mics to come. And then John will point your way and uh, ask audibly. Thank you. Um, would you be able to say something, please, about the particular issues facing those who are ministers leading a church as they come to retirement? Thanks very much. That's a really good question. And to be honest, I'm not sure that I feel very qualified. Um, but I can see that there are particular issues for uh, church leaders and ministers who come uh, to retirement. One, I, one of the, the complexities, because well, I know that within some churches, including in the Church of England, the basic recommendation is that when uh, a church leader comes to retirement, that they should leave the church where they've been ministering, sometimes for decades, uh, and, and go somewhere else completely different. It's almost like they wash, they wash the dust off their, their hands. And I've always felt deeply uncomfortable about that. It just seems strange that somebody who has invested their, their life in a community uh, is then expected to just walk away and have no contact with, with that community. Now, I can see the, the challenges about uh, for somebody, the new leader coming and so on, but I don't think those things are insuperable. So I, I think it's a really good challenge and question is how can we perhaps develop new models which give people, once they face retirement, a new ministry, new opportunities of serving, um, wh whilst recognizing that their, their previous model of, of, of ministering or church leadership uh, comes to an end. So 
I think because so many of us are facing these issues, we need creativity. We need to find new models, new ways of addressing these issues. But so thanks very much for raising, raising that question. John, um, I know exactly what I would like. I would like, for example, what thrills my heart is to be in a big modern church with lots of young children um, where I can be a grandmother to them, even though my own children don't have children, and, and to be really in a thriving church. And yet I feel God is calling me to something that makes my heart go heavy, to a local village church with, you know, views so and so, and I had felt there was a clear calling of living there for at least five years. I'm struggling with the house, I'm struggling with the church. So, you know, and you say, go for what thrills your heart. Where is that, you know, is God leading me or I'm just imagining things? Well, thank you so much for the question. And I, and I think, you know, you're expressing one of those really difficult challenges which so many people later on in life struggle, and that is, is my calling to carry on serving in what seems to be a very challenging and difficult area, or are there desires and longings in my heart which, which I still haven't been fulfilled? And I, I can't give you, of course, an, e an easy answer to that, but I do think that these desires and longings are, are something to be honored and respected. And, and I believe that God wishes to fulfill our longings, but often in ways that we don't expect. You know, so often um, our, our deepest desires, God reaches out to us, and then you suddenly realize, oh yes, this wasn't what I expected, but this is uh, filling and nourishing and satisfying something deep inside. So I think it's a particular issue to pray for, isn't it? Lord, you know these desires in my heart. Uh, how, help me to understand how you wish to fulfill them. Uh, I know that you want to satisfy me with goodness. Lord, I'm, I'm available. I want to be used by you. I want to become the person you made me to be. John, um I've got about four and a half years, I guess, before I retire. Um, what do I do between now and then to prepare so I'm ready for that 68 in my case? Well, thanks very much. And I think that's a really good question because most of us don't ask that question. I certainly didn't ask that question. And I wish I did. So actually, the Retiring Well course, and, and if you can get a hold of that handbook, that gives a whole series of questions, issues, discussions, and things that you could start now, and which actually would be really helpful. But I, I think it is a, about thinking ahead and asking these fundamental questions. What, what is it likely that God is going to call me beyond? You know, what is the new things that are going to, uh, that are going to be important for me? And thinking both in terms of duties and responsibilities. Yes, there are always shoulds, or what are my responsibilities going to be, but also, what would I say, yes, wouldn't this be amazing? Wouldn't it be wonderful if I could really invest in this, if I could put more time into this? What are those deepest longings? And maybe again, looking back, what are those moments when my heart was singing? What is that telling me about the future and, and the way that God might be calling me in the future? Last question. Um, John, thank you very much for this morning. I have a confession to make. I was going to another seminar, but it was full. Um, <laughs> I've so I, the quick. I, I, I've ended up here, and I'm so <laughs> glad that I have. I found it, I found it. <laughs> I don't know about the rest of you, but I found it extremely encouraging. Thank you very much, and God willing, I'll be here tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs> Um, and uh, let's express our appreciation very much to John. For... Thank you. Can I lead us in a brief prayer? 
Our Father, we thank you for the help that our brother John has been able to give us this morning as we approach this uh, vital top topic. And we pray that you'll help us to uh, chew over what we've learned, and uh, we pray put these things into practice, not only to our own benefit, that we may indeed know more of that joy that you promise, but that we will serve others and bring you glory with the gift of time in retirement. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Just to say a, a reminder that if you have a question you'd like to write down, pass a piece of paper to one of our stewards, and that will reach John in time for tomorrow. We're in here again tomorrow at half past nine as we consider some of the challenges of transition uh, that are going to happen as we get older. So half past nine tomorrow, and then this morning back here at 11.15 for the first of our Bible readings. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Sweet and bitter tears.